I'd like to begin this section of our study on freely falling bodies by showing you video footage of Apollo 15 astronaut Dave Scott dropping a feather and a hammer simultaneously on the surface of the moon. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather, in my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, but it proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Up until Galileo's time, it wasn't understood how a heavy object and a light object could experience the same motion. Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, said that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. And that's our everyday experience. If you drop a penny and a feather at the same time, the penny, which is heavier, hits the ground first as the feather flutters down. But we've come to find out that this happens because of the presence of air friction. If you're able to remove air from around the feather, then it too will fall at the same rate as a penny. And if you're fortunate in your class, perhaps your instructor will demonstrate something like this using a feather and a coin in a vacuum tube. We call any object that experiences only the gravitational force a freely falling body. It doesn't matter how the body got going. It doesn't matter what the motion of the body might be. It could be that it has thrown up. It might have been dropped. It might have been projected into some curved path. Once it's left, whatever set it in motion, if the only force acting on it is its own weight, then we call it a freely falling body, and its motion is called free fall motion. The acceleration it experiences is the acceleration due to gravity, which near the Earth's surface is about 10 meters per second squared. That number would change if you were to go to the moon, where the acceleration due to gravity on the surface is about 1.7 meters per second squared, one-sixth of Earth's acceleration. That's the reason you saw the feather and the hammer in the astronaut footage drop less quickly than it would on Earth. If you were able to travel to Jupiter and stand on its surface, you'd find the acceleration due to gravity to be about 26 meters per second squared, more than two and a half times Earth's g. Quite frequently, you're going to be asked to describe the motions of these objects. We're going to begin in one dimension, eventually working our way to two dimensions. We'll call that two-dimensional motion projectile motion. Let's remind ourselves of why the acceleration is what it is, writing down the equations of motion that govern how the objects move. Let's suppose I toss a rock upward in the air. The rock goes straight up and it comes straight back down. Let's sketch a free body diagram of the rock after it's left my hand. If it's close to the Earth's surface, and if we can neglect air resistance, which we'll do in most of these problems, then there's only one force acting on it after it's left my hand, and that's its weight. Now, it's important to remark that the rock is in free fall only after it's left my hand. While it's in my hand, it's not an object in free fall. Only after I release it does it become a freely falling body. So now, what's the object's acceleration? Well, let's apply Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the acceleration is the unbalanced force divided by the mass. In this situation, there's only one force, its weight. Now let's recognize that we're dealing with vectors. So there's a positive direction and a negative direction. So let's sketch a coordinate system. Now which way should be the positive direction? I have some suggestions about how to choose. If your object is initially moving, which means it's got initial velocity, then choose that direction of the initial motion as the positive direction. But on the other hand, if the object is not initially moving, then choose the direction of the acceleration as positive. Now in my case, my object is initially moving. It's initially moving upward. And so I'm going to call the upward direction positive. Sometimes up will be positive. Sometimes down will be positive. You, the person who's working the problem, the student, the physicist, have the power of that decision. And some choices may be easier to manipulate mathematically than others, but that doesn't mean that one choice is better than the other. It just means that one choice will have you dealing with more negative signs than the other. In my coordinate system, since my initial motion is upward, then I'm going to call upward the positive direction. Now with that said, let's determine the acceleration. The net force acting on the object is its weight. 
And since that force is in the downward direction in my coordinate system, I'm going to put a negative sign in front of it when I write it in Newton's second law. I'll note that the weight is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. When I make that substitution, the masses cancel each other, and what I'm left with is the acceleration is equal to negative g, negative 10 meters per second squared. Now this is an interesting result. It doesn't matter what the mass is. All objects in free fall, whether feathers or elephants, are all going to fall with the same acceleration if we can neglect air resistance. It's always in the downward direction. I have to pay attention to my coordinate system to determine whether that's the positive direction or the negative direction. If I call upward positive, then the acceleration is going to be negative 10 meters per second squared. If I call down positive, the acceleration is going to be positive 10 meters per second squared. Now, let's remind ourselves of the equations of motion under constant acceleration and what the meanings of the variables are so that when we go to work the problems, we can figure out what to do. These three equations are sometimes referred to as the equations of kinematics. V is the instantaneous velocity, the velocity at the time t that I'm interested in. V naught is the initial velocity. How fast and which way was the object moving when the clock started at t equals zero? A is the numerical value of the constant acceleration. T is the elapsed time. Y is the instantaneous position, where the object is at time T. And Y naught is the initial position. Let's now use these to solve some numerical examples. Example 20.3. An object is dropped from a height of 40 meters. Part A, how long does it take for the object to hit the ground? In part B, what's the velocity of the object just before it hits the ground? There are several things that are given to us in this problem, some of which are explicitly stated and others of which are implied. So I'm going to sketch a building or a tower or something that has a ball that's 40 meters above the ground. Or better yet, just sketch the ball 40 meters above the ground. They say here that the object is dropped. And if it is dropped, what that means, it is released from rest. And so that implies that it, there's an initial velocity of zero. Now with that in mind, that helps me in the choice of my coordinate system. I know that the acceleration is going to be free fall acceleration. The reason I know that is because the only unbalanced force acting on the object is the object's weight. And so it's going to experience an acceleration of 10 meters per second squared in the downward direction. I'm going to choose the downward direction to be positive because my initial velocity is zero. And that's the suggestion I made about the choice of your coordinate system. And since the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, then the acceleration is going to be positive. Now, if I think about my coordinate system, if I set, I usually set the origin to be the place where the action begins. And I like my origin y naught to be zero. And that's the place where the ball starts, which is right here. Down at the bottom, it's 40 meters away in the positive direction. So y at the bottom is equal to 40 meters. Now the question asks, how long does it take for the object to hit the ground? How long means how much time? So we're looking for time in this problem. So I think about the equations of motion I've got. I notice that I have numbers for everything except time, and the second equation of motion will relate all those things together. So I'm going to pull out that second equation of motion under constant acceleration. I know what y is. It's 40 meters. y naught is 0, and v naught is 0, so those terms are going to disappear. And with those terms being 0, then I can write y in terms of a and t. And now, if you'll permit me to do a couple of steps of algebra in 1, I'll multiply both sides by 2, divide both sides by a, take the square root of both sides, and that's going to tell me what t is. So now I'll put in the numbers, and now I need my calculator. I get that the time is 2.83, if I round it to 3 sig figs, seconds. Now, for part b, what is the velocity of the object just before it hits the ground? When we say right before it hits the ground, that means that the object will just begin to come in contact with the ground. And I know that that happens 2.83 seconds after the object's dropped. I can use the first equation of motion to figure out what that solution is and substitute in this time here of 2.83 seconds. The initial velocity is zero, and now I'll put in the numbers. 2.83 
I could do this one in my head. The speed is 28.3 meters per second. Let's go to the next one. A two kilogram rock is thrown downward with an initial velocity of 20 meters per second from a height of 120 meters. How long will it take for the rock to hit the ground? Well, they tell me the mass of this rock is two kilograms. But one thing that you'll find in these problems is that the mass doesn't matter. If I think about what the acceleration is, the acceleration is the unbalanced force divided by the mass. The only force acting on this rock is its weight. But the weight is equal to mg. And now the m's go out. And I'm left with the acceleration due to gravity. In other words, the magnitude of the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. And the direction is in the downward direction. So let me sketch a picture of this. The object is thrown downward. So it has an initial speed in the downward direction. According to my suggestion, I'm wanting to take the downward direction to be positive. The initial velocity is 20 meters per second downward. If I set the origin at the point where I throw the rock downward, then when y is equal to 120 meters, we will have reached the end of travel. And we're trying to figure out the amount of time that it's going to take for the rock to hit the ground. Again, I can use the second equation of motion to help me solve this problem. I notice here that t is linear and quadratic in this equation. So it may be that I have to pull out the quadratic formula to help me solve this problem. It turns out, though, that with my ti89 and the solve function, I can get it pretty handily. And I think that's what I'm going to do. So at this point, I'm going to put in the numbers and then use ti solve to help me figure out what t is. So now I'm going to substitute this into TI solve and get two answers. My answers are that T is equal to negative 7.29 seconds, or T is equal to 3.29 seconds. One of those roots is realistic, and the other one is not. And so I'm going to toss out the unrealistic root, the one with negative time. In other words, in this situation, this rock would hit the ground 3.3 seconds after I threw it downward. We have one more example will work. A ball was thrown vertically upward from a platform that was 40 meters above the ground. The initial velocity of the ball was 10 meters per second. With what velocity does it strike the ground? How long does it take the ball to hit the ground? The thing that makes this problem a little more challenging is that I have an initial velocity in the upward direction, but the acceleration, 10 meters per second squared, is going to be in the downward direction. Those have opposite signs, and I'll have to indicate that in my equations of motion. First, let's sketch a diagram. I'm going to set the origin where the action begins, and I'm going to call up the positive direction. Now, the place where the ball hits the ground is on the negative side. So I'm going to have to say that the ending point, y, is negative 40 meters. The ball starts upward with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. And the ball's acceleration is in the downward direction, so it will be negative 10 meters per second squared. The question is, with what velocity does it strike the ground? There are several ways to do this. I'm going to try the way that uses one of the equations of motion we haven't used yet, the third equation of motion. We're trying to find v in this equation. So I could take the square root of both sides. Notice that when I take the square root, I create two roots. One is positive and one is negative. And the interpretation that I'm going to give to this particular problem is that since the ball is moving downward, it's the negative root that I want. Now I know all these numbers underneath the radical sign, so I'm going to substitute them and figure out what the speed of the ball is when it hits the ground. Now be very careful with your signs here, because in the expression, there is a plus 2ay minus y naught. The acceleration is a negative number, so you're going to be adding that 2 times the negative 10, and then y is also a negative number. So you've got to pay attention to these negative signs. They can be pesky, but they happen to save us in this particular situation because I have a negative 10 times a negative 40, which is going to turn out to be a positive number, and I won't get an imaginary number when I take the square root. So let me do the math, put it into my calculator, and I get that the velocity is negative 30 meters per second. 
Now in part B, how long does it take the ball to hit the ground? I can use the first equation of motion along with this instantaneous velocity that I just calculated in part A and solve for the time. And if you'll permit me to do several steps of algebra, I'm going to subtract V0 from both sides and divide both sides by A. And now I can put in the numbers. Now again, be careful with your signs. And now I can do this one in my head. The time is 4 seconds. So, what we've done here in the second part of this lesson is to solve free fall equations using the equations of motion under constant acceleration. Sketch diagrams, write down what variables are known, and then select the equation that helps. That's it.